and welcome to the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Simon Rowland. Simon, thank you very much for coming on. Before we get into this episode, make sure you follow us on Twitter, at BettingPod, and check out the website, businessofbetting.com. Guest suggestions are much appreciated. This podcast is proudly sponsored by Betfair Proprietary Limited. Betfair operates a betting exchange and is licensed in the Northern Territory of Australia. Residents of Australia can join Betfair by visiting betfair.com.au and support this podcast by using promo code BOBPOD. Please gamble responsibly. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Business of Betting podcast. Today I'm joined by Simon Rowland. Simon, thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure, Jake. Simon, very quickly, before we dig into the more substantive topics, do you want to give a brief summary of your background and experience in the in the world of betting and, and more particularly, I suppose, in horse racing? Yeah, sure. Um, as you might be able to tell from my accent, I'm British-based, <laughs> always have been. Um, have been pretty interested in international racing for much of my career. Um, I started off at Timeform in, in Britain in the 1980s, um, editor there, handicapper, um, bet for a living for a while, um, around about the time the Betfair, uh, Betfair Exchange started in the early years of this century. Uh, was briefly a racing editor of a national sports newspaper, which, when I say briefly, it was, the briefness was the paper rather than uh, me in particular. Um, that only lasted about a year. Um, but more recently, in the last 10 years or so, I've been a, a freelancer on uh, racing analysis, blogger, um, a tipster for At The Races, which is the online version of Sky Sports Racing in Britain, and still quite an enthusiastic punter, in fact, very enthusiastic just at the moment. So that's very comprehensive. Is there any aspect of that that brings you the most joy? Of late, I think backing winners <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, recommending winners to others has been because um, I, I I haven't usually been a tipster. That I did do the Timeform phone service, which is a subscription service, but that's twenty five thirty years ago now. Um, so I haven't done that, and I viewed it with a bit of trepidation when at the races asked me to get involved a year ago um but it's really fulfilling when things go well unfortunately they have gone well at the moment um i do love writing about stuff my background i i did english at university and i um love the writing aspect of things but um the great thing about racing and betting is it's such a wide um discipline that uh, you can always find different things to do yeah there's no doubt about that and i in preparation for this discussion, I looked at some of your writings on, I think it's on Betfair actually, where you go into a myriad of different topics and write at length with a, a serious degree of expertise in a lot of those from you know probability to just general form, sectional timing, all those different aspects. So if someone is interested in where to look to find some of that, that's a good, uh, I guess, a good collection of, of probably just a small portion of what you've written about. Yeah, that's called the, it's probably the time form knowledge I did it about five years ago. I, I think one of the things I do like about um, some aspects of what I do, things like that, is that it, trying to explain what can sometimes be quite complicated subjects in a way that people can comprehend and um, look deeper into if they wish, really. It, it's, uh, I'm not saying that I definitely pull it off. Um, plenty of people think that I overcomplicate matters, but um, that's the challenge, really. Well, I found certainly when I was reading it that you took somewhat – broad and complex topics and distilled it into some very good examples and different ideas that are relatable. So but perhaps I was in the minority, but I highly doubt it. So I'll link to that if anyone's interested in that. But one aspect I want to pick on first or talk about first is time form and splitting up those two words quite literally, time and form. And I know you spread yourself across many different disciplines and aspects of, of betting and racing, but I want to talk generally about the process and the, the form component, which includes obviously the sectional times, for example, and some other 
other methods, let's call them. And then further down the line, let's hopefully, you know, save some time to talk about the more practical application of that. Yeah. From a general perspective, in terms of the process related to handicapping, doing the form and analyzing sectional times, all of those different parts that go into that, what are you trying to achieve? Do you have something or have you distilled it down into one thing that you're trying to achieve? Are you trying to get a profile for the horse? Are you thinking about the race in, 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 in its entirety? Or is it too easy and too simplified to try and distill everything down into that one idea? I think a bit of all of that, um, all of the you know, profile in the horses and, and the race more generally. But um, I'm very, uh, my background is in form handicapping ratings um, uh, for, for a few decades now. And um, I will start with a an assessment of the horse's chances in a fairly conventional way in a race, in, I suppose, and then try to layer other things um, of which time analysis and sectional analysis are perhaps the most obvious on top of that. Um, but it's not just about defining a horse's ability or um, potential through numbers. It's also down to, you know, understanding your horses, um, interpreting uh, how races might play out, um, which comes from a knowledge of sectionals, but also more widely. Um, but a lot of it is certainly grounded in, in figures. Um, I was just talking about this with a friend of mine the other day, and I, I think I do an awful lot of sort of groundwork in the figures department, but it's odd how when it comes to actually tackling a race, it still quite often comes down to a degree of intuition. Um, I don't think you have to get away from that kind of fuzzy logic understanding of what is a complex, you know, multi-faceted uh, problem in front of you. But um, the basis is form ratings, time ratings, and perhaps especially sectional ratings, which um, sort of bring the two, the form and the time together. So tell me your perspective on sectional times and its, I guess, progression through the decades. You mentioned, I think you said you're at time form in the UK in the 80s from, from there to today when we're talking about multiple decades. How have sectionals been thought of? How has that progressed over the years? And ultimately up until today, how they stand within the industry? Yeah, um, I had the um, good fortune to overlap with the founder of Timeform, the legendary Phil Ball, by about a year or two, and didn't have all that many dealings with him. He was in his 70s and I was in my 20s, but um, I did have a chat with him about things like time analysis, and he was interested in sectional timing himself uh, back then. I wasn't, and um, people who know me now might be um, quite surprised at that. It probably took... Uh, I don't think there was one light bulb moment, but it was sometime in the 90s or probably the second half of the 90s when I realized I was perhaps the edge that was there with just assessing form, the actual results, um, and taking them as read, that put you ahead of um, the vast majority of the opposition up until the 1990s had, had gone to a degree, and you, you needed a more nuanced and way of interpreting what was going on and what may go on. And um, as in other sports, uh, results in horse racing do not always reflect the merits of the participants. Um, that can be sort of um, the, a realisation of, of which horses possibly should have won or uh, might have been flattered by winning um, can come from visual analysis of race reading of, of races and things, but also from crunching the numbers of how they've gone about running their races. And uh, so from my point of view, I kind of have been um, beating the drum for sectional timing for about 20 years now. Um, in Britain, though, it's not really taken hold as much as I personally would like. Uh, there's been small amount of coverage um, a company called Turf Tracks covered all the all-weather racing here in, uh, about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, but more recently, there's been an increase in interest, and um, 
the British Horse Racing Authority that runs racing in Britain has um, indicated its support for including funding for sectional timing um, from this year onwards. So um, I'm hopeful, as I've always been hopeful, really, that um, things might uh, progress further than they have done so far. So in a way that, you know, expected goals or expected shots on goal or whatever the the adjusted metric is in other sports, does sectional timing and sectional times and the analysis of it provide an additional layer of context to the horse race? Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually had an idea about something a bit like expected goals. It wasn't precisely expected goals. I pitched to Betfair in the six months when I was working there over 10 years ago, but um, they weren't really interested. But the same sort of principle, and if you tackle football, rugby, I'm sure it's the same for other sports, you want to know the components that go into performance rather than just the simple outcome, because certainly in some sports, outcome, simple outcomes can not tell you the whole story. And uh, yeah, I think sectional timing in particular, it's not alone in this, but sectional timing in particular in horse racing can help you define that. Do you have a sense of how often the outcome of a race accurately reflects you know, the merits of each horse. And what I mean by that is, you know, if it's a zero zero soccer game um, and you're talking about expected goals, the score could possibly have been fairly zero zero or it could have been one team should have won four nil, for example. And there's a, a wide distribution of possible results on that in horse racing. Do you think that in general, the result of a race, a horse race is generally based on the merits of the horse or there is a wide variable in that sense? More the latter than the former. It's a long time since I actually, somebody asked me this question and I gave them a definitive answer. Of, I think it was something like 30% of races were won by horses who, in inverted commas, shouldn't have won. Um, I think it was in that region. But even in the other 70% of races, there are horses who have finished fifth, who might have finished second, or finished second and might have finished fifth. And um, it's definitely in the minority where races can simply be taken as red um that in itself though can be quite useful information really um you know if you look at the figures uh take the sectionals crunch the numbers and find that the race is every very much as it appears that that in itself can be useful in an environment where a lot that can't be said of a lot of the other races that's an enormous amount. That just makes the idea of uh, any additional layer of context critical, I would imagine. Yeah, I think so. And um, I, I would say the evidence of results uh, shows that as, as well. Um, uh, Timeform, who I don't work for other than as a freelancer now, uh, produce a sectional t- uh, timing archive in which they uh, specify upgrades to performances and um, the vast majority of performances deserve some sort of upgrade from the basic re- what was told by the results. So, um, and I think that has, you know, proved its worth uh, time and again. Uh, that's not to say that um, anybody who's interested in sectional timing goes around sort of disputing every every performance or every result, um, but they need to be. Um, you know, dissected and looked at and figured out whether they really are as they appeared. And as you say, going back to other sports, I think that's, uh, that's I was going to say a problem, a challenge probably um, across all different types of sports. Yeah, fairly assessing the merits of a performance when oftentimes it's very hidden to the to the naked eye is, is ultimately a challenge in almost every endeavor, uh, certainly in sporting and racing around the prediction side of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just generally, can you speak to what are some of the, uh, essentially, what are you trying to achieve when you're announcing the sectional times? If you can sort of condense it into a two to three minute response, which might be difficult, but in terms of after a race, what you're looking for, how you convert that into a figure or a profile of a horse, and then how you use that looking forward to help with your predictions. Yeah, uh, primarily, I suppose I'm trying to capture ability um, of horses over being flattered um, by uh, compared to more basic analysis, or especially those that are better than generally appreciated. Um, I'm also looking to identify 
which form is solid and which form is questionable. Um, a really slow to run race or occasionally a, a race in which there's been a pace collapse up front. Um, you can try and weave your sectional magic over it, um, but there's still a degree of um, supposition involved and um, you probably best uh, regarding those kind of races with a certain degree of um, caution. Um, and you need to know that while you're carrying it forward to betting, etc. I'm also looking for stamina and speed of uh, potential of the protagonist, um, especially, uh, I'd say especially with likely raced flat horses. Um, and this can be forward looking as well as backward looking. Um, a horse who's shown that it can lead at a good pace is a different proposition to one who leads only on sufferance, for instance, um, uh, when you're looking to project how uh, a pace scenario will happen in the future. So take me through when the analysis becomes at a critical mass whereby you have enough data points. So if it's a young two-year-old, for example, with one or two starts versus a more experienced horse with 20, 30, 40 starts, is there a time where you can essentially fully create a workable profile? You can do from a pretty early stage, hopefully. Um, one, of, one of the problems in Britain is that you quite often uh, having to uh, figure out your own sectional times. There, there's a very good company called Total Performance Data who's providing sectionals from several courses now. Um, but if, for instance, you're looking at one racetrack and you're trying to figure out sectionals, you're not going to be able to realistically take them for every individual horse, for every individual furlong. So there can be a sort of a, a slight absence of information, which means that you do need to build up a picture uh, of a horse over a few starts. But the idea is that if you can capture it, you know, it's sectional potential at an early stage, it, it can identify a fairly ordinary maiden winner as a potential listed or even group horse. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, um, horses who have, run many times in handicaps they they still are maybe interesting betting propositions and their potential within the context that you find them may may be hidden um other than through sectionals so particularly in a closed environment like all weather during the winter in britain i i, I think you can get quite a lot of mileage out of still dealing with those relatively more exposed horses as well but um the big payoff I would maintain is with those horses who who are just starting out and um, who, you know, on the face of it, maiden winners, some of them are just going to go on to be fairly ordinary handicappers and some of them are going, going to go on to be classic uh, contenders and uh, that's really where you can get a, a, a massive edge, I feel. Do you think using the raw sectional times themselves is okay or do you think you need to have some form of adjustment and whatever it is that you value, whether it might be, let's say the mm. horse has a higher weight than average or a higher weight than it did previously, or let's say the horse, I don't know, was in the lead and you have wind metrics and you think that the wind had an impact on its raw speed, for example. Are there things that you add to the raw sectional time to make it more of an adjusted sectional time? Uh, yes, very much so. Um, all those things you mentioned uh, are factors, but there's a fairly straightforward way of tackling it because you're looking at a, a horse's performance compared to itself in a way, how efficiently it runs from A to Z via B, C, D and E. Um, the way that I devised of doing it is by calculating a finishing speed percentage, which is the speed uh, over the closing stages of a race compared to the same horse's average speed for the race overall. Now, if it's completely if it's running completely at the same speed at the end of a race as it did on average before that, you'd get 100%. Um, horses that are finishing quickly might be running 105 or 110%. Horses that are finishing slowly, 95%, et cetera. And that incorporates an awful lot of that information that you've referred to, like weight carried ability. And the crucial thing is to compare those finishing speed percentages with what you could expect for the course and distance uh, for a horse running efficiently. Overall, in Britain, the usual par finishing speed percentage is around about 101, 102% or something like that. 
but it will differ for courses like Epsom, which are down uphill early, downhill late, uh, will have a much faster finishing speed percentage. So the process of comparing a horse's actual finishing speed with the par for the course and distance leads to upgrades of how it performed. There's some physics behind this, which um, I, I wrote a book, which is uh, free to download via a time form. I wrote that about five years ago and um, goes into some detail in that. But basically, the more inefficiently you run compared to well-established benchmarks, the more your overall time deserves to be upgraded. And if you can, you can do that for each horse in a race without a huge amount of effort, actually, and um, then sort of look at what the result should have been in theory. It's been quite a long process getting to get it sort of fit for purpose, but um, I'm pretty confident that I kind of understand the limitations and the advantages of that kind of approach. No, that's that's certainly fascinating. Do you think if you took 10 random experts, let's call them in horse racing, and did the same or asked them to complete the same analysis, there would be 10 variations on certainly different from what you came out with? If you asked... 10 other people to come up with um, ways of interpreting se sexual times. I'm sure they would come up with different different ways of going about things. But the, the logic of this particular approach, and it's not the only approach uh, by any means uh, to get value out of sexual times, um, should lead to very similar conclusions. I would say that when I started 20-odd years ago on trying to come up with formula, etc., for interpreting these things, I base quite a bit of my heuristics, I suppose, on uh, my time as a race reader. So when you see a horse who's gone off in front and has gone three or four lengths clear and then it fades towards the end, and you know it's better than the results, what kind of, what kind of outcome are you looking for um, when it comes to actually reframing that race in terms of ratings to reflect that that horse ran better than the result. And um, so whilst it might seem quite high-tech and mathematical at times, it's, it's very grounded in the kind of horse racing experience and expertise that people have acquired, certainly not just me and certainly not me as a, a leading exponent, particularly in that area, but um, that people have acquired over decades. Um, uh, it... So the outcomes don't throw up complete, um, or seldom throw up complete uh, curveballs. They they tend to make sense and pass a sense check that um, that horse that you saw that's made up five lengths, but in the closing stages and to finish on the heels of the leaders becomes rated a winner if if it was doing that against a pace bias, but might actually be slightly flattered if uh, the opposite was true. So um, the theory and the um, knowledge behind that, all the sectional timing calculations, is is based around kind of common sense and our shared experience of how races pan out, or I'd like to think so. How well do you think the market captures a lot of this analysis and a lot of this information? Do you think it's at a point now where it's pretty efficient, and but it took 20 or 30 years, or do you think there's still room to move with respect to the betting markets? Uh, definitely still room to move. Um, there was a time five or 10 years ago when people, probably more like five than 10, when people started taking sectional timing quite a bit more seriously, and you would see horses who previously you'd thought only you had spotted opening at five to one and going off at five to two, um, fairly frequently but uh, one of the things about British horse racing is there's so much racing that there's and so little um, sectional information provided on a plate for people that there's a lot of scope to for individuals to uncover nuggets of their own and try to capitalise on that um, from a sectional point of view um, without everybody landing on the same horse. Um, that said, um, it was perhaps a little bit more of a timing than a sectional timing um, 
horse last last summer that there's both me and another two people who clearly use times and sectionals and are, are pretty influential in terms of um, tipping and, and affecting the market. We all three of us went big time on this horse and uh, the price absolutely collapsed. Uh, the horse called Natalie's Joy at Royal Ascot ran deplorably and then popped up again and beat a future group winner the next time. Uh, that's betting, isn't it? <laughs> that's perfect. I'm sure that made many people who aren't on the bandwagon with sectionals very, very happy that day. <laughs> yes. I only want to make people happy, and sometimes it happens uh, inadvertently, yes. <laughs> so horse racing inherently is a sort of an open system, or there's unlimited factors and variables that people can come up with and assess as useful to uh, predicting the outcome. So how critical with that in mind is the form component outside of the sectional times to you? It's really important. Um, having said that the vast majority of performances, races can be reinterpreted in, in the light of sectionals. Um, it's quite often tinkering around the edges. There's still um, no getting away from the fact that a you know a well handicapped horse is can, may be able to overcome difficulties and and that trying to define a horse's ability um, starts with a form analysis and um, sectionals may only add a little bit to that um, you know a good horse is a good horse and uh, you can't escape that I. Um, base pretty much all of my assessments and my bets in the first place around what might be regarded as fairly conventional form ratings. I refer to time form. I come up with my own figures um, based around my own kind of way of assessing things, which is pretty similar to time forms. I think you have to um, acknowledge that form, the, the, the ability of a horse captured in one number still counts for a lot. Um, in, in the modern era of very competitive racing, it's fairly rare to see a horse ignored that has got an excellent chance in terms of form. So it can be the little tinkering around the edges of things like draw analysis and um, trainer form and sectionals, etc., which which give you the edge that you do need but um form analysis form ratings is, is is the basis of a lot so tell me a little bit i'm just going to throw this out there the the evolution of the betting markets in the uk over your time you mentioned you know you've you've been betting for for many years how has it changed or evolved has there been golden eras versus mm. some um some different ebbs and flows over your time answer it however you like but i'm curious from your perspective how it's how it's changed over the years that's a really interesting question, and um, it's something which has occurred to me m more recently um, since I've probably started betting a bit more seriously again in, in conjunction with, with tipping, um, because I do bet all of the horses that I tip. And things have changed, and changed for the better in some respects, which I hadn't fully appreciated. I think there are far more ricks, um, mistakes made by bookmakers, certainly with early prices. We, I think we all know that if you snap all those up left, right and centre, then there can be a reckoning um, in terms of not necessarily being able to get bets on in the future. But if you're discerning and discriminating, then there are opportunities out there now, um, which I think are better in terms of pricing up from bookmakers conventional corporate bookmakers than than I can remember for a long time. Going backwards in time, definitely the advent of Betfair Exchange in sort of 2002, 2005 was a golden era where there was growing liquidity, but also still quite big margins if you were a layer, and I was primarily a layer, but also opportunities as a, as a backer and the um, ability to, you know, manage your position both back and lay, I think, um, you know, was absolutely a ground changer um, back then. When I first 
came into racing, almost none of the racing was televised. And therefore, I got my edge by going to race courses. Um, fortunately, I found Timeform would pay me to go to race courses and report back afterwards. But you would see things not just in the paddock, but on the track that other people weren't seeing. Nowadays, and the, it's been a long time now, um, you know, th nearly 30 years, I think, um, there are, isn't a lot that happens on a race course that goes missed by certainly by the shrewder operators in the business. Uh, but back then, in the 80s, um, you could see horses who were showing great potential and nobody else would spot them. So I think that perhaps three golden eras, and I'm not sure I'd describe now as a golden era, but maybe a silver era, um, where I think there are opportunities if you shop around, as well as a lot of, um, a lot of options of different ways of betting. So that would be my summary. Interesting, because I wanted to ask a question around if you were advising a 21-year-old person getting into this field right now, would you, if they had a choice between the handicapping side and some of the technical analysis we've spoken about and, and doing all of that in a, in a very meaningful way, or just grabbing a time form rating and using that as your handicapping analysis versus focusing in on the betting markets, the, the different back and lay options, the different corporate bookmaking options, the difference between getting an early price and, and betting later and trying to find derivative markets and, and all these different things. What direction do you think you would lead a young person towards if they had a choice between the two? I inevitably would want them to go down the same road that I have in a way. But um, for me, the acquiring of uh, knowledge of, of understanding of the sport is actually more valuable than any of the wins that you can get from bets. Um, fortunately, as you acquire knowledge and understanding, betting becomes a little bit easier, if but not easy. Um, so I think understanding why things happen, understanding how horses' abilities can be compared with one another, understanding things like handicapping and um, how efficient ways of running or inefficient ways of running affect how they run and putting figures on that is an end in itself, really. But fortunately, one of the good spin-offs is the should at least not lose quite so much money from betting. And if you're disciplined and good at it, you might even make some. So um, I, you know, I'd encourage anybody... Um, who was starting out to try and understand the sport and enjoy it as a result. And I think you enjoy betting uh, much more as a, as a consequence, but it's not an easy game and none of us has cracked it ever. <laughs> and we're all still learning, but that's part of the fascination, I think. Yeah, I, I agree. And I've had a conversation with many people in certainly in recent times about it. And I think more and more in this day and age, uh, if a lot of your processes are automated, on, on let's call the handicapping side, a lot of things are automated, scraping of data, putting it into a system, having the algorithm spit out a number or a profile on a sports team or a horse, whatever it might be, and then focusing in on the, the betting markets and the trading side, that's obviously one way to do it and, and probably far easier to do it these days. And then uh, they'll talk about the green lumber fallacy or all these different things as to why that's a feasible and meaningful way to do it and prof profitable way to do it. Versus the other way where certainly a lot of, you know, my father's generation grew up loving the sport or loving the, the horses. And I think it seems to me that you can be in this game a long time if you have that underlying passion and affection for understanding the, the sport itself or horse racing itself. And the I guess the, the beauty of horse racing handicapping and the, the beauty that it is the chess game. And I've certainly spoken to a lot of people who have done it for a long time and that effervescence still comes out after 10, 20, 30, 40 years of doing it. Yeah. I, I should state to this point, I, was, um, I mean, I've been instrumental in automating quite a few, particularly numerical processes. I, and I, I love that aspect of things as well. I don't think it com need completely remove um, any human involvement. I Obviously, I realize there are very sophisticated models which 
uh, you know, pretty much do exclude human involvement. But as a as an ordinary, you know, enthusiast about horse racing, you can uh, automate aspects of it. Um, I, I, I automated uh, the form racing side of things with Timeform and with uh, the national newspaper I work with and for a couple of betting syndicates. And I love that aspect of things because it gets to the real root of what performances are and what results can tell you. Uh, also did a fully automated odds line from horse racing, which I wouldn't mind revisiting someday. Um, it's uh, not as successful as it could be, but as an indication of, you know, a, a ballpark indication of what odds you should expect a horse to be trading at. And then, but for me, I think I really enjoy the bit where you take it beyond that and you still can take personal charge of your decisions and um, increase your understanding along the way. Yeah, exactly. And I think just the world we live in, things certainly in the betting world can become more dispassionate and, you know, some people might bet for a living on horse racing in a very machine-like manner and not know the difference between a chestnut and a grey or a filly and a mare, yet make money on it. But I just think even speaking to some of those people who are certainly in their, let's say, their 20s, I think doing it long-term, it seems to be a valuable component to have a bit more of a, a connection with the underlying uh, sport or, or race that you're, you're betting on. I read an interesting book um, a few months ago called Hello World by Hannah Fry, who's a mathematics professor, um, and it was a lot about automation. And I was really reassured uh, to find that the common uh, thinking now is that a lot of more complex subjects, and I think horse racing analysis and betting can be complex, benefits from sort of a meeting of both of automation and human domain expertise um so talking about artificial intelligence and self-driving cars and things like that and um the the her take on things was that com uh, that the prevailing thinking at present is that you can benefit from both automation and human in intuition i suppose hopefully where i'm at to a degree yeah, I definitely agree, and I think that's something that as we get more and more towards you know the computation of different aspects and algorithmic thinking, let's call it, uh, not missing out on the fact that, yes, you could do horse racing and cricket and rugby and NBA and NFL, potentially. I just think in terms of a, a long-term perspective, there seems to be some utility in in that passion behind it. But anyway, I want to switch over a little bit and talk yeah. about something that I've been reading about and We've certainly been talking about the evolution of sectional times and the evolution of form analysis and handicapping. Looking forward, it seems to me one of the areas that I certainly don't know a lot about and will become more interested in is stride length and, and stride data. And I've seen you mention things like average peak stride length. So take us through a little bit about how that all started and, and where we're at. And I know it's a new area and you probably have some secret sauce you don't want to talk too much about. But if you if you don't mind sharing... Uh, some some thoughts that'd be great. Sure. Um, a total, total performance data we provide sectional timing. I think it's eight or nine race courses now. It's increasing almost on a monthly basis. Also do striding uh, analysis. Um, I believe it. I, I, I'm not sure about this, but I imagine it's a bit like wearing a Fitbit, which can detect the kind of movements which signifies strides. Um, so there's quite a lot of now uh, interesting information about stride, uh, both stride length and stride frequency. And uh, my initial sort of research in this area, uh, fairly obviously when you think about it, stride length is affected quite a lot by circumstance. So if you're running downhill, you'll stride longer if you're, than if you're running uphill. If it's a soft surface, it will shorten your stride because it would take more force to get the same propulsion forward. Um, so whilst nearly all the great horses over the years, Frankel, See the Stars, American Pharaoh, etc., have got long strides, um, it's almost a prerequisite of a, a really good horse. 
Um, sometimes they wouldn't stride particularly long uh, in, in given circumstances. The other aspect of it, so, you know, in simple terms, a horse gets from A to B by striding, not just its stride length, but how often it turns over, how frequently per second it turns over its stride. So the other component, which um, stride frequency or cadence, as it would be known in, in athletics, is actually really quite a lot more interesting because that does not vary very much by circumstance. Um, and you don't need a particularly deep look into the data to establish that. And what it tells us is that in order to be a sprinter, you have to be able to stride quickly. Um, there's almost no sprinter of any worth who's not been able to stride 2.5 strides per second or quicker. Um, but that, that stops you staying far unless you can relax during a race. So stayers stride more slowly, 2.2 strides per second, something like that, um, two strides per second for jumpers. Um, but the ability uh, and the most notable example of a horse who can do both is Winks, who strides can rev up to 2.6, 2.65 um, when required to take off, but relaxes at a much much lower rate earlier in the race. The really interesting payoff, I think, of this is when you're trying to establish what horses will do in the future when they're running as two-year-olds or earlier three-year-olds. So last year there were horses, contenders for the derby over here, over 12 furlongs, who strode um, like mile, mile and a quarter horses, but not mile and a half horses. And fortunately, um, for me anyway, they they did seem to run out of stamina once they got beyond a mile and a quarter. And that could be inferred, not with absolute precision, but um, in terms of probability that could be inferred from the speed with which they turned over their stride. So it's a way of getting ahead of the game in terms of stamina in particular. But it, um, it's something I've only been looking at for properly for about 12 to 18 months. So I'm, I'm learning quite a bit about it, but um, there's definitely something there, particularly in terms of, of cadence. Do you think it's, or what are the indicators in terms of how it will be utilized into the future? Do you think it'll be a, a fringe metric that is an additional piece of information, much like certainly at the moment, something like the weight of the horse might be. And I know some jurisdictions mm. have that as available data and others do not. But do you think stride length will be something that we'll see in a newspaper form guide or probably an online newspaper or whatever it is in 15 years? Or do you think it'll be something that might just continue around the edges and only certain people will A, use it and B, probably know how to use it properly? Very much more likely to be the latter than the former. And I, I, I don't think it would be appearing in... I, I think horse weights, if they ever appear, might appear in things like race cards, but I doubt that striding measures would. It's particularly useful, rather than for exposed horses, where you, regardless of what the striding is telling you, you kind of know what they are and what they stay. Um, that It's not going to be a great deal of use, but it's particularly useful for not only for punters, but for people looking to buy horses and campaign horses. And uh, there's been quite a bit of interest within the industry uh, in in that area. But uh, yeah, I think it will remain fairly niche. But um, uh, there's undoubtedly times when it can help you decide either as a potential buyer or for the purposes of having a bet um, whether you're going to risk whether a horse will stay or not. And um, I think that's pretty valuable in in certain contexts anyway. So one final question for you, Simon, around the idea of intuition. And mm -hmm. it's often a contentious topic or hotly debated, let's say, and some will use it almost for their whole analysis, others not at all, and they're purely systematic or, or somewhat machine-like or automatic. How do you think, based on your experience over the years, intuition plays into all of this, whether it is, for example, some of the stride length stuff you're talking about, it, it requires some, it's not, you know, the precision isn't actually there. You need to have some intuition, it sounds like. Across the board, what place does intuition have based on your experience? I think I've neglected intuition myself over the years and I, um, until more recently, perhaps, I probably 
you know, I was fascinated by the numbers. That's primarily what really got me interested in horse racing and in betting. It can be defined. A lot of these things can be defined by numbers and by algorithms, and, and we have done, but it's an exceptionally complex sport. Um, and in a way, training your own mind to approach a race, to understand what race, similar races and similar horses have done previously, I think can have a bigger payoff um, than just dealing with numbers alone. So I don't think I'm by any means, and, and in fact, I know I'm not by any means the most intuitive uh, punter, but um, I'm wel welcoming it back into my repertoire much more these days. I, I, I think um, there's quite a lot of place for it, despite the fact that, you know, putting in a great deal of groundwork, which is pretty much number orientated. Do you think your intuition has gotten, in quotation marks, better over the years, or do you think it's, uh, it is what it is? It's ebbed and flowed. I, I think it was, I, I'd like to think it was quite good in the early days when I probably didn't know as much about the numbers, but I don't think my intuition was all that good in my kind of mid period, and I think it's got a bit better again now as I've been able to stand back and perhaps take my foot off the number crunching a little bit more. So um, it's definitely something you can work on, um, but uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a dark art really isn't it um you're not entirely sure why you sometimes why you view a favorite with suspicion or actually think it's a really good bet um but provided you you're not just doing it entirely on a hunch i think it's worth listening to your instincts really yeah it's a entirely fascinating topic and something that we could cover for hours and it would you know change over the years and all sorts of things so i'm I'm always intrigued to hear from the experts and what they think. Simon, I want to thank you again for your time. It's much appreciated you, talking with someone of your caliber. And, um, yeah, I, I hope we get to do this again one day. Okay, great. All the best.